I'm Richard Stammelman, Executive Director of the Montgomery Endowment, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome Jules Pfeiffer, Pulitzer Award-winning uh, cartoonist, um, a person who for 40 years produced a weekly cartoon for the Village Voice, who, has, who won a, uh, an Academy Award for one of his cartoons, who then moved on to writing plays, wonderful plays, and screenplays for movies, Little Murders, Carnal Knowledge, and Popeye. And since the 1990s has been writing fantastically humorous and philosophical uh, stories for children, like Bark George and The Man in the Ceiling. Jules, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Dark. Thank, thanks, Thank Richard. Let me begin by a, a, a simple question. How did you start out in cartooning? What well, I started out at four or four and a half, just drawing, and drawing the heroes of my childhood who were comic strip heroes, the newspaper comic strips. The newspaper comic strip used to appear in papers that were these broadsheets, they were not tabloid, you know, and, and they ran across the page in f sometimes six columns, and, and uh, they were huge, unlike today with their postage stamp size. And, uh, and this preceded television, so there was no TV. It preceded color movies. I mean, only very few movies were in Technicolor. So this was a major form of entertainment and, and, and of pop attraction for readers uh, of all ages all across the country. And, um, and as a kid, I'd spread the paper out that my father would bring home, and I would devour, and it would devour me because I would sink myself into the, this glorious graphic form, and um, which was a lot better than living during the Depression in those years in the 1930s and early 40s, and let my imagination run riot and dreamed that I too would be one of the boys, that I would grow up to be one of these cartoonists. That's all I ever thought of doing. That's all I wanted to do. And, um, and eventually I got to do it in a very different form from what I ever imagined. When you uh, used to do your weekly cartoons, how did the idea come to you? In other words, did you draw um, uh, figures first and then add the dialogue, or did you write the dialogue first, or both at the same time? How well, it, it, it was mainly um, the idea of the dialogue. It was mostly a written form. Mm -hmm. And then I have to figure out what pictures were appropriate. But I would write on yellow sh legal pad paper I would scroll opening lines trying to figure out where I, where I was going. And like almost anybody in journalism, I was a creature of deadlines so that I wouldn't have an idea at all until um, the gun was to my head and I had no time not to have an idea. And then it would start coming. And then because I was commenting on social scenes, cultural scenes, and a lot on politics as Vietnam heated up as the civil rights movement got into play. Um, certain subjects were just very much on my mind and everybody else's. And, um, and since I had a particular and uh, at the beginning peculiar take from the left because nobody, uh, nobody on the left got into print mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the 50s, um, except perhaps in the Village Voice, uh, I kind of knew what angle I was working from and where I had to go with it, just trying to offer a different point of view than from what one usually saw. Now, let me pursue the idea of the, of the dialogue because in class the other day, you, you mentioned that one of your desires in writing cartoons or in creating them is to keep the dialogue moving forward, that it was very important to do that. And one of the things that I was struck by in reading your cartoons was the way you cleverly and poetically use repetitions. For example, that wonderful cartoon where Huey says, yes, I'm crass, put your shoes on. Yes, I'm allowed, put your shoes on. Why this uh, emphasis on repetitions in, in, in the dialogue? Well, you know, it's a, it's a good question, and the answer is very simple. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, um, I think after years of doing this, and that particular cartoon, I've been doing it, the strip for, I don't know, eight years, mm -hmm. or, 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 not that long at the time. But you build up um, a personal style. And just as the drawing style is personal, it's mm -hmm. been compared to handwriting, uh, the verbal style, it, it's um, my aim always in the dialogue in the script was to uh, make it sound authentically um, in the vernacular, mm -hmm. make, make it sound like conversation. Most 
comic strips didn't talk in conversation. I wanted mine to sound like um, people really talked. And of course, if you do, uh, if you do exactly the way people talk, there'd be no room for the drawing. Mm -hmm. So it had to be an illusion. And then it had to be cut and cut and cut and cut. And eventually, through that method, you arrive at some kind of approach where repetition seemed to help move it along. But I wasn't consciously doing this or anything else. I was just trying to tell a story that while I was trying to make a point, I also knew that I was in the entertainment business. It had mm -hmm. to be fun to read. It had to be, uh, it had to take the reader from one panel to the next panel to the next, both in terms of the dialogue and the art. So there were all sorts of craft mm -hmm. um, problems that one had to solve. And rather than see them as difficulties, you see them as challenges and you worked your way out. Now to move from the dialogue to, to the line, the, the drawing line, you once said, um, in may, may have been one of the interviews, thank heaven for, for steaks, because uh, you go to a restaurant and you <laughs> yeah. get these long pointed dowels and you start using the dowel in order to, to, to uh, create your line. How has your line, your, the drawing line, evolved over the years? Well, when, when I was a kid, of course, I drew in pencil. Mm -hmm. And there was a freedom and a looseness and a, a feeling of the moment in pencil that in reproduction where I couldn't use pencil, I mean, today you can because they, digitally they can do anything. Mm -hmm. But in those years in a newspaper, uh, it, it, wouldn't come, it would come out blotchy or not at all. Or, you know, and so uh, it had to be either pen and ink or brush and ink. Mm -hmm. And I found with both pen and brush, I didn't like the line I got. Mm -hmm. uh, it, um, it left me unhappy. It didn't have the freedom. It didn't have the looseness. It didn't have that sense of the moment. And I experiment with anything I can get my hands on to try to recreate the illusion of immediacy that a pencil gives you. It's that sense of the moment that I always wanted to get on paper, that I've always wanted to get in my plays, mm -hmm. uh, or in all of my writing, the sense that it's happening as you view it or it's happening as you look at it up on stage or on the screen. One of the great joys was uh, uh, the screening some years after I wrote Carnal Knowledge. I looked at the movie and sat there thinking these guys are making up their lines. You know that 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 the illusion mm -hmm. of improvisation uh, was very much there, and I love that. I love being erased as the creator because it means that the reader or the viewer is involved in the moment, and mm -hmm. that's what I cared about. So, in a way, in a way, what you're interested in is the authenticity of the expression, whether it's drawn or spoken, because it seems so natural and it also seems so direct and. And, and true and, to life. And, and yet it has to move to a point. It has mm -hmm. to tell the story I want to tell. And in cartoons, it's the combination of words and pictures. Mm -hmm. People don't make the connection uh, um, except when they're told, but that, that the whole point of being a cartoonist uh, or a cartoonist in strip form is that words and pictures are one and that the reader should not and cannot be aware of what he's looking at and what or, or what he's reading. It's just all one composite, and the form is only workable and only uh, uh, at its best when you just move from one thing to another. Whether it's an old-fashioned comic strip or today the graphic novel, mm -hmm. the, all all these rules apply, and mm -hmm. they're the same rules. Over the years, from the 1950s to the 1990s, you have drawn n almost all the, well all the presidents of the United States and many politicians. Who was the easiest f presidential face to draw, and who was the hardest? Is it possible to, to look at it from the point of view well, of rendition? Um, all of them, I found, were hard at the very beginning, mm -hmm. e even Nixon. I mean, that, that, that because I found my approach, uh, I'm not by nature or instinct a caricaturist, and, um, and I had to get some sense other than the public sense, the public mm -hmm. persona of the president, to be able to draw him. So that um, I was very frustrated, say, with Lyndon Johnson, because mm -hmm. in his first nine months in office, I thought he was the best president of uh, my working lifetime, I mean, since FDR, because he was getting a Voting Rights Act through mm -hmm. and a poverty program, and I thought he was great. And so my drawings were lousy. And, and um, other cartoonists were drawing him very well, and I couldn't get him until I actually was invited for the one and only time to a White House uh, um, uh, lunch, and there he was in person, and I saw how different he was 
from his photographs and, uh, and on television. Because, uh, uh, where, uh, when you see a photograph, it's the big nose and the big ears. And mm -hmm. the, but I, what I saw for the first time was the, the line of the mouth, the tight mouth. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Texan mouth is a kind of no lips. And he looked like a guy at the bank who was turning down your loan. And uh, <laughs> it gave me an insight and a clue as to how to draw him. And then it was fun to do him. But mm -hmm. up until that time, I was just having an awful time. Mm -hmm. Nixon, of course, was Nixon. And he was a joy. But, he, but, but, but uh, he, he was much more fun after Watergate as he f began to physically dissolve in front of you. The eyes got so this, Everything began to dissolve mm -hmm. uh, all over his face. And you know, there's something quite uh, uh, satisfying about drawing a president melt melting in front of you. Uh, especially one you despise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The um, during the well, since the war in Iraq, and even during the war in Iraq, th there was a lot of criticism of the American press for not asking the right questions, for not being persistent, for not doing what the fourth estate is supposed to do: investigate, examine, criticize, and reveal. Do you think that editorial cartooning has? Um, Kept its uh, honesty in ways that perhaps uh, the, the newspapers and the and the written editorials haven't. In other words, they've been critical. They continue to be critical, and they um, uh, haven't folded to the bureaucratic powers of, of the U.S. government. Well, but you're talking. Well, you're most cartoonists, as most people in, in every field, are hacks, and they do what's easy, and they do mm -hmm. what's satisfying, and they go for the easy laugh. And as it is in every other field, there are a half dozen or perhaps a few more of first-rate, mm -hmm. really creative intelligences. Tom Tolles in the Washington Post is one. Pat Oliphant, who's been around for years, mm -hmm. uh, is another. Tony Auth in the Philadelphia Inquirer and Signa Wil Wilkinson in the Philadelphia Daily News, and there are others. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Jeff Danziger, mm -hmm. who, uh, you, know, uh, you know, one of the great cartoonists of our time or any time. So there are, are, are a handful mm -hmm. of people who take a look at these problems and do amazing work in response to them. And then, like uh, the rest of the media, particularly cable news, the rest, the, they either go for cheap shots, easy shots, or distort um, what is going on. The uh, one thing that you mentioned in class, and you mentioned this in some of your other um, uh, interactions with students, was the way that um, governments use fear in order to um, manipulate the populace. And this is something that you learn from the McCarthy years when uh, McCarthy definitely used the fear of uh, the threat of communism to manipulate people. How does, how does one fight that? In other words, how does one fight that when one is an artist, when one is a, a cartoonist, when one basically has the, the, the popular ear and eye of the American populace in the newspapers? Well, you know, coming along in the 50s with my work, um, I started work in 56, post-McCarthy. Mm -hmm. But the residue mm -hmm. and self-censorship of the McCarthy years was still very much in play. The blacklist uh, in uh, movies and television was still at work. And, um, and the response to my work when it first appeared in The Voice startled me because it wasn't that people said how funny, how good, how entertaining. They said, how'd you get that into the paper? Uh, how'd you get away with mm -hmm. that? And I realized that, that urban New York liberals, who were generally the audience I w uh, the, who were reading me, didn't know and hadn't known for some time that they had First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. That there was, uh, it, that th the notion of having to watch what you say except to your intimates was so in place, uh, and this is three years after McCarthy, that, um, that people, didn't think they could get in, in, into print with this sort mm -hmm. of thing, and often they were right. I'd watched television in those years, and it's not that much different from TV today in many ways, where um, certain views you saw over and over and over and over again. I mean, David Brooks appears on every TV c c c uh, cable show you look at, you know, once, and, and, and he represents, he's smart, and he represents a particular conservative point of view, uh, which can be revealing and helpful at times, but it's the same David Brooks. Mm -hmm. But you don't see much of Katrina Van Hoovel of the nation uh, or any other writers of the nation, except on M MSNBC mm -hmm. only on occasion. That, that the same kind of um, heavy-handed uh, uh, notion of what the middle of the road is. The middle of the road starts over on the right mm -hmm. 
and, 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 um, and that was so in the 50s, it's so today, uh, even as they talk about the liberal media, and, uh, and it's always been so. So what I represented was an attempt to push the uh, dialogue over to the left somewhat. And, um, and for a while I was the only one doing that, so mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun being the only kid on the block uh, saying things that, that, uh, that in a sense represented readers who hadn't seen themselves represented mm -hmm. in, in for some time. And that's what started things going for me because people like to see their thoughts, their feelings in print or on the air and it wasn't happening back mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. At a certain time, you stopped cartooning um, and you concentrated your uh, talents uh, on other forms of writing and drawing. And uh, even though you were probably doing cartooning at the same time that you were writing um, plays and doing uh, screenwriting, was there some reason why you decided to uh, move slowly away from cartooning, which eventually well, I, you did? I did I, you know, I, until I gave up the strip, I, in 98, yeah. uh, during, just before the Gush, Bush Gore mm -hmm. um, election, I was doing the same amount of cartooning yeah. as always. Uh, the, the, my interest in it has diminished somewhat, and my readership had diminished because people were no lo longer reading The Voice, and, syn and uh, the syndication had fallen somewhat. But it was pretty close to what it had always been. But the, but the Voice audience, the people who used to read The Voice and get a charge out of The Voice, The Voice had changed, mm -hmm. and its readership had changed. And I no longer had the kind of clout that I had, oddly enough, until they fired me. And then I started appearing on the op-ed page of the Times, mm -hmm. which uh, a few more people read. And that was great fun because it, uh, it re-announced me and, mm -hmm. and suddenly there was a, uh, it, 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 it was very exciting mm -hmm. to be read and commented on again. And I forget the beginning of your question. Well, uh, the, the question I had uh, that I was leading to was, have you over the years found um, well, why I got into this why you got into it. do you think in many ways that screenwriting and playwriting have offered you um, a medium of expression that you weren't able to fulfill well, in cartooning? Uh, not movies. Screenwriting is, yeah. um, except for carnal knowledge, only for the money, mm -hmm. uh, because um, producers want to control, mm -hmm. directors want to control, and with the exception of Mike Nichols, I've, uh, I've never had. Uh, an easygoing relationship with his film director. Mike's experience came out of theater, mm -hmm. and with theater it's a very different uh, 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 set of principles with his actual collaboration mm -hmm. uh, um, among colleagues, among equals, and everybody uh, gives and nobody thinks of being in charge and nobody's, uh, nobody's ego takes over. In movies there's almost nothing but ego. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's never been or seldom been a pleasant experience. But I moved into it into playwriting as a result of the uh, assassination of John F. Kennedy, where I saw, uh, following Ruby's uh, killing Oswald, mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to me that all forms of authority, all forms of what we had taken for granted in our country were slowly dissolving and we were, seemed to be on the verge of a national nervous breakdown, uh, which was literally changing how we looked at ourselves and felt about ourselves. And I didn't see anybody commenting on it in those mm -hmm. early years. And I thought it had to be commented on. And so I started to put together what at first was a novel, which was going to be Little Murders, and it got nowhere after two years. And when I look back at my original notes, I thought this has to be said. And so let me see if I can dramatize mm -hmm. it. I was reluctant to try to write a play because I was a playgoer. Mm -hmm. I loved the theater. And the theater I loved were plays that... Um, uh, if I really liked them enough, they closed in two or three days. But, and, uh, and if I walked out on them, they got the Pulitzer Prize <laughs> or, or the Tony. So <laughs> I felt pretty confident that if I wrote a play I thought was any good, it would close in a week. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I wrote a play that was pretty good, and it closed in a week. <laughs> and it was Little Murders. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, it was brought back two years later. Uh, the critics had caught up with what I was trying to say. It was a hit. It was a movie. And, uh, and I had become established in this new form which I loved as much as cartooning, and, uh, and so I was fortunate to be able to continue in it. But in the past, uh, let's say, decade, w you've moved uh, into yet another form of writing, which is children's books. Um, 
uh, is there some reason why you decided to concentrate your attention on children's books, the drawing involved in that, well, and the writing of that? Well, it was all indirect. Yeah. I have a memoir coming out next year called Backing Into Forward. And uh, its argument is that virtually everything that happened to me that was any good, and that uh, staked out the territory I followed, uh, um, I stumbled into, I mean, I backed into, that, that the things I wanted to do, it turned out I never did do or I was not qualified to do, or I was just bad at it. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, uh, and as far as children's books go, I had illustrated years earlier, back in the 60s, The Phantom Toll Booth by my friend Norton Juster. Mm -hmm. But it certainly wasn't anything I wanted to do again. Uh, I wanted to overthrow the government. That was mm -hmm. my job. Mm -hmm. and, 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 mm -hmm. um, and so I was much more interested in politics than children. The years went on. I think my feeling about politics had exhausted itself pretty much, that uh, uh, I thought I was in there to do some good and to make a contribution, and I saw the contribution I was making uh, was seemed to be non-existent in terms of changing anything, and we were repeating the same problems over and over and over again. I note, parenthetically, that as I teach my class here, which is graphic humor in the 20th century, that uh, going back and doing homework and doing research, that, oh my God, everything I'm, that, that's happening last week happened 50, 60, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I began to feel that this is little more than an ego trip for me, and what's, what's the point? It's not going to end up in anything. Well, writing for kids, which again I backed into, I hadn't mm -hmm. meant to do it, but then I have three children and, and uh, at various ages. And, um, and once I got into it, I discovered that I liked it as much as I did the cartoon or, 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 the, or writing plays, and it allowed a side of me out mm -hmm. that cartooning didn't allow or playwriting, because both of them I treated as adversarial forms mm -hmm. where I attacked issues and, uh, and beat up on readers in a sense. You know, and I mean, I tried to be funny, but I was basically going after preconceptions and mm -hmm. trying to address them and change them. But um, with the kids' books, uh, I didn't want to beat up kids. They get beat up enough. And I didn't want to change their, <coughs> their preconceptions mm -hmm. because uh, they need whatever imagination they have. They need whatever defense system. I wanted to be a support system, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be on their side. I wanted to be uh, the, the, the writer that uh, they would pick up and read and feel, as with my early cartoons, that they were represented. So it, it, it brought out a whole, whole more playful side mm -hmm. of me that I had with my children, I had with my friends, but no fans of mine who've read my work over the years uh, ever saw or seldom saw. And here I could let it go. Mm -hmm. And I had a great time. I still do. Mm. You once said that the role of the cartoonist is to be angry. Now, in the past three or four weeks that I've been with you, you, you seem to be a very pleasant guy, very calm. Passionate, yes, but calm. So, um, why do you need to be angry? Well, I mean, th you know, th this was back. I mean, I'm not angry anymore. It, it, it's uh, if you reach the age of eighty and you're still angry, um, you've probably had three or four heart attacks. But <laughs> it, it's uh, so I haven't been angry for some time. But in in the fifties and sixties and seventies, you know, there was a lot of reason to be angry. Yeah. I mean, angry at the society. Yep. Angry at our, uh, um, uh, our our official lies. Angry at our misuse of language. Uh, angry at our uh, lip service to things that mm -hmm. we had no intention of carrying out. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, there was official abuse of the citizenry, and the citizenry, who I was also angry at, seemed to be content to let it go on mm -hmm. and let it happen. I mean, at, 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 at the second Bush election, George W. election, when he beat Kerry, my anger was very much on not just Bush, or not so much on Bush, but on the American electorate who, having s seen how bad this government was for over the years, uh, and how it lied over the years, and having turned against the war, still turned toward this president and mm -hmm. reelected him because th they thought he had a more genial personality than John Kerry, or whatever it was. And that just, that <laughs> reintroduced anger in yeah. me. But by that time, I'd quit the field and wasn't going to put it to any use. The, uh, let me ask you one question that is perhaps a little uh, vague or abstract or 
uh, requires a little reflection or a little philosophical speculation. How do you see humor as part of everyday life? Graphic humor, stand-up comedy, uh, comedy itself, um, theatrical comedy, the, the whole role of humor in, uh, in, well, let's say in American life. Well, uh, I hate to disappoint you, but I've never actually cared about that question. Okay. I was just funny from the time I was a kid. And, um, and I'm sure that a lot of it was a defense mechanism. I was sh small and skinny and couldn't stand up to anybody. Your average girl could beat me up, you know. And, and um, so I think I used humor as I used my drawing talent mm -hmm. to, um, to be able to go out in the street and not get slaughtered. Uh, I got accepted because I could draw pictures and I could make people laugh. And um, so I always thought, I mean, I always saw my humor as a means of attaining some kind of credibility with others mm -hmm. out there because, uh, who could play ball when I couldn't and uh, who could dominate when I couldn't mm -hmm. and had authority I didn't. But I could draw and they couldn't and they let me live. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's always been a survival tool. But mm -hmm. then as I started to write the cartoons and the plays, I found that if you were making points that were off kilter, that were unfamiliar to readers or, or theater audiences, you could get further by disarming them by being funny and, you know, and basically go through the back door, not assault them, not be polemical, not announce what you're saying, not have a character in an Arthur Miller hortatory style mm -hmm. uh, say this or say that and, you know, and declaim. Uh, but do it subversively, do it underground, do it through jokes, do it through, through laughter. And, um, and it resonated mm -hmm. longer and made its point better, it seemed to me. But that may just simply be rationalized a skill I had from the time I was a child and, and still enjoy using. Let me ask one final question, and this has to do with the future of cartooning. The, the um, dissemination of information, misinformation, uh, popular culture has changed so radically over the past 20 years thanks to computers, the internet, Facebook, um, new technology that enables uh, uh, cartoonists and artists to, to draw um, via computer-assisted uh, techniques. How do you see the future of cartooning, let's say, in the next 20 or 30 years? Do you see it continuing as it is now, or do you think the technology that is so prevalent will change not only newspapers, but also editorial cartooning and political cartooning? Richard, having come to know me in the last three or four weeks, you know that's a very sadistic question to ask me. <laughs> you know I can't use a computer. You know I don't know anything about a computer. You know I have no access to my own email, uh, 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 that, that I need help in even uh, scrolling up and down. Uh, uh, and um, so uh, I'm sure there's a future somewhere mm -hmm. um, for cartoons, and, uh, but I have no idea about where this other stuff is going. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, uh, I don't really care. <laughs> Well, on that note, Jules, thank you so much for being a Montgomery Fellow. You've been an extraordinary presence on campus. The students love you, and the faculty loves you, and uh, you have five more weeks, and I hope we're not tiring you out too much. Well, thank I, you very I, much. I, I, I hope you don't find out the truth about me in that time. <laughs> thank you.